So did we create in our mind the truth? Or would that have still happened? You're an absolute gem. Thank you for clicking on my suspect series. I'm Brooke McKenna, but this is about reincarnation, past lives, and murder. Now this case has all of these topics within it and whether you believe it or not is up to you, but if you don't, then you can just see this as some creepy entertainment purposes because this story is beyond insane. Now let's go ahead and dive into what supposedly happened to the Pollock girls. I'm not sure exactly how to say their last name. I've seen it pronounced many different ways, so if I'm saying it wrong, I'm sorry, but that's just how I'm going to pronounce it through this video. By the way, I am continuing my suspect series, so if you do enjoy these type of videos, please make sure to subscribe because there will be so much more. Now let's get back to the story. So Joanna was born in 1946 to John and Florence Pollock, who already had two sons. Then five years later, in 1951, they had another daughter and they named her Jacqueline. And shortly after that, they moved to Hexham in Northumberland in England. Now the two sisters got along so incredibly well, they were basically best friends. They lived in a quaint, quiet town, and really there was not much to do except for play with each other. But their parents actually owned a milk and grocery delivery business, which took up most of their time, so the girls and the brothers were raised by their grandmother most of the time. But the girls didn't mind because it actually made them closer to be with their grandmother and Joanna kind of took over the motherly traits and took care of her little sister Jacqueline a lot of the time. But that wasn't her only personality trait. She really was a creative young girl. She loved to wear different costumes to act out plays that she had created, but she wasn't a control freak about it either. She actually loved to share costumes with any other children around and her sister, and she loved to really do everything with them and involve them in it. Jacqueline, the younger sister, was pretty young and still kind of coming into herself, so she would do a lot of the things that her older sister was doing, and they really loved to do hair together and would often comb their father's hair when he was home from work. But Joanna, the older sister, she often said that she would never be a lady. And people around her just thought, okay, she's a creative soul, she never really is going to want to grow up, and that's fine. But it turns out that she was right in a very disturbing way because she would never get to grow up at all. So was Joanna really just making a harmless comment? Or did she know her fate? So it was 1957, Joanna was 11, Jacqueline was 6, and they were a pretty happy family. Their business was doing well, and they were also getting along really well. But on May 7th, everything would change. Jacqueline and Joanna and one of their friends were walking to church when a car drove into them. The children were trapped by a wall on the other side of the sidewalk when the car began speeding towards them. And upon impact, the Pollock girls were said to be tossed in the air like cricket balls and were killed instantly. Their friend who was with them was named Anthony Layden and he didn't die upon impact, but he did later at the hospital. The woman who had drove into them had taken lethal doses of aspirin and other drugs in a suicide attempt because her children had just been taken from her. Some people believe that her mentality was also, if I can't have my kids, then nobody else can have kids either. This was a widely covered incident throughout Britain and even through the trial, and eventually the driver was committed to a mental institute for what she had done. Now. The parents both handled it very different ways. Florence wanted to kind of put it out of her mind and stop thinking about it altogether because she was in so much pain, but John really wanted to continue to think about them every moment so he would never ever forget them and what happened. But throughout all of this, from the public speculation to the parents, they all wanted to know one question. Why did this have to happen to three sweet, innocent children? John said he actually experienced a vision of his girls in heaven, and later he sensed their presence on the, one of the top bedrooms of their house, and so he decided to hang out there a lot just to feel closer to them. See, John Pollock was born in Bristol in 1920 and went to the Church of England before converting to being a Catholic. But at nine years old, he actually read a book about reincarnation and really strongly believed in it. So much so that he prayed to God to give him evidence of reincarnation 
so that he could prove the priests wrong. Florence, on the other hand, became Catholic because of John and did not believe in reincarnation whatsoever. But after the girl's death, John began to think that possibly this was a punishment for all of those years ago, praying that he would have evidence of reincarnation. But his guilt was also kind of subsided when he would have visions of the girls being reborn into the family. He didn't know what to believe anymore, and upon talking to Florence, she completely dismissed the whole thing. She had fallen into a very deep depression ever since the girls passed, and she told John she did not believe in reincarnation or heaven at this point. It led to so many arguments between John and Florence that they almost got a divorce several times, but they ended up staying together, and shortly after the girls passed, Florence was pregnant again. They went to the doctor and the doctor saw one baby, one healthy baby with a heartbeat, but somehow, in surprise to everyone except for John, twins were born on October 4th of 1958. Two babies. This was a little over a year after the girl's deaths and the doctor swore that he only saw one baby, yet Jillian and Jennifer, newborn twins, right in front of their eyes. But there was no history of twins and John or Florence's family, so they couldn't understand how this just randomly happened. John's belief that these were his daughters reincarnated became even stronger, but Florence still wasn't so sure until she examined their bodies. Jennifer had birthmarks that were exactly like the ones that Jacqueline had had. At the age of three, Jacqueline had actually fallen into a bucket on accident and had gotten a gash over her right eye by the root of her nose, which left a permanent scar. And now Jennifer had the exact same scar. She also had a roundish dark birthmark on the left side of her waist that was the same exact one that Jacqueline had as well. And if Jillian and Jennifer were identical twins, which they were, they would have matching birthmarks, but Jillian didn't have any. Her twin sister was matching with their deceased older sister. How is that possible? But that's not the only strange thing that happened. Many things happened after that. The whole family had moved to Whitley Bay to get away from the area where this tragic accident had happened once these new twins were a few months old. And once they began to be able to talk, they began asking for their toys. Not only that, but they would describe them in grave detail, the toys that their older sisters used to play with, and the toys' names. The twins were too young and didn't know yet about their older sisters who had passed away, or at least that's what the parents thought. But when they brought down the toys from the attic that their older sisters used to play with, they grabbed the exact ones that used to be their sisters' favorites. They even said Santa's gifts, which was correct again because their older sisters had gotten them for Christmas. And they also didn't fight over these toys like normal siblings would. They seemed to know what toy belonged to what sister. And they also enjoyed the same foods as their older sisters had. Stuff like this happened so often between the, the ages of three and seven that it, is, it was just completely unbelievable. Jillian actually once pointed to Jennifer's eye right where her scar was and said, this is where Jennifer fell into the bucket, which was true, but not of Jennifer. Jennifer actually asked her father one day why he was wearing mom's coat. And he replied, how do you know that this is mom's coat? And she said she would wear it when she delivered milk but their mother hadn't delivered milk since Jacqueline and Joanna had passed. Then the Pollock family decided to go back to Hexham to visit for a little bit when the girls were about four years old. When they went there, they were headed across the street and you could not see anything on the other side when all of a sudden the girls said that they wanted to go to the park that was over there and were describing the swings that they wanted to play on. The girls had never been to this park before, but their sisters had often played on it, and they led the adults right there as if they had been there a million times before. They also knew a lot of the same landmarks that were in town. They knew exactly where they used to go to school, which was where their sisters went to school. And this was stuff that supposedly their parents had never told them about. Not only did these twins remember things about their sisters' lives, they also remembered their death and would often describe it in present tense. Jillian would hold Jennifer's head and she would say, the blood is coming out of your eyes. This is where the car hit you. They were also terrified of passing cars, and one time a car engine was turned on an alleyway nearby, 
and they started screaming and freaking out, holding each other, saying, the car, the car, it's coming for us. Jillian mothered Jennifer just like Joanna had done to Jacqueline, and Jillian almost seemed like she was Joanna. She loved costumes, she loved acting, and she just had that motherly personality just as Joanna had. She also had that mature personality that would be kind of of an older sibling even though they were twins. Jillian was also slender like Joanna had been and Jennifer was a bit thicker and stockier just like Jacqueline was. Jennifer also held her pencil upright when she was writing and that was something that Jacqueline was actually working on when she passed away. Overall, it seemed like these twins were carbon copies of their older deceased sisters and the newspapers couldn't get enough of their story. This led psychologist Dr. Ian Stevenson to want to do more research on them. He started visiting in 1963, but as the twins grew older, it seemed that their memories or their visions or whatever you want to call it slowly started fading away, and by the time they were five, most of their memories of a past life were gone. Their parents didn't continue to talk to them about it at all, and in fact, they didn't even know what reincarnation was until they were 13. But by that time, they really didn't know anything and were living pretty normal lives. Dr. Stevenson went back a few times throughout their life, and in 1978, when the twins were 20, he did some blood tests after talking to them a little bit just to make sure that they were identical twins. And it came back as positive that they were. They came from one single egg, which would make Jennifer's random birthmarks that Jillian didn't have even more suspicious. Genetics couldn't explain it either, and neither could an influence within the womb, like if the mother would have been thinking, you know, about her daughters and it could have made an impression on the babies in the womb. That really is very rare to happen, and it would be very odd and strange in this case, especially since Florence wasn't even for reincarnation before they were born. But when they were 20, when the doctor was talking to them, they said that they did accept their be the belief that their parents had that they were their older sisters reincarnated. They didn't really know if they were or not, but they accepted what their parents believed. Their mother Florence died in 1979, and two years later, Jillian began experiencing visions of when she was younger, or so she thought, where she was playing in a sandbox with her brothers. When she described the house, the lawn, the orchards, everything around, it was perfectly matched to a house that the Pollocks had lived in in Wickham, except for the twins had never lived there, but their older sisters had. Although that there is some seemingly good proof, there of course is always skeptics, like there is always allowed to be but they believe that the parents actually made it seem like this was happening when it really wasn't and then planted seeds in the twins' mind to make them believe that. And Dr. Stevenson considered that as well and came to the conclusion that it would be impossible for even the parents, even if they tried their best, to get the children, the twins, to act like their older sisters exactly and to mold their behavior and their recollections to make it so realistic when they were so young. The part about the birthmarks are what really shocks me because I feel like birthmarks are just such a weird thing that some of us come into the world with, some of us don't. Like, what do they mean? I would like to explore that in another video if you guys want. But the thing about this is that I, I couldn't find picture proof of both the twins and the sisters having these birthmarks. So who knows, this may just be an entertaining story, an urban legend, but I thought it was interesting for you guys and you guys always seem to like the story aspect of it, so I hope you did enjoy that. But what do you think happened? Feel free to leave your comments down below. Please always be kind to one another down there. I think this can be a space for, you know, everybody's beliefs as long as you're kind to one another. And I, I don't know, I don't really know what I believe about it either. I think that it's an interesting thought that this could happen to a family and it's kind of, you know, heartwarming if it did because they lost their two girls to this tragic accident and got them back, essentially. So, I don't know. If you don't believe in it whatsoever, I hope you at least watch this with just the premise that it was an entertaining story, like if you were reading a book or watching a movie, and I hope you enjoyed it anyway. And if you're okay with me doing more um, 
like urban legends or just like cool stories that I find, I would love to do those for you because I don't know if I've told you guys, but I actually write novels. I have written two and I'm on my third one now. And so I love stories and I would love to read any that you guys want or research it or whatever. So let me know if that's something you guys want by thumbsing up this video. Now don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye. The power of thought is a crazy thing, but so is pain.